me about the um, the the, the uh, African memory of this period in history and how how willing are are many people to um, to talking about it and visiting. Um, Africans remember enslavement so well. Um, the research I've done shows that I've been involved in looking at Ghana in particular from 1990. I've been to about all the 10 regions of the country, conducting interviews with chiefs, elders, um, state historians, old men and women, anybody who can remember something about enslavement. And it's amazing the kind of information and material I have got about it. Many of them regard enslavement as a very sensitive issue. And what I have done is that in my research, I've tried to identify with the people. And I've used some of my students in the Department of History. And I've always warned my students that I would want students who come from the area uh, to undertake this research. I don't want somebody who is spending holidays in the area. Because a lot of people regard it as so sensitive that if they don't know you, they wouldn't disclose some vital information to you. So the memory is still real um, and people are very reluctant to talk about it because it brings up some kind of unpleasant memories sometimes. And I think another reason why is because there were two aspects to enslavement in Ghana and in most Africa. There was what I would call an internal aspect or what people call an indigenous aspect of enslavement. And then there was an external aspect that is enslavement with, between Africa and the outside world, either with the Mediterranean or Red Sea, Indian Ocean world, or with the Atlantic world. And because of this, we still have some memories about both enslavement, especially the indigenous one, because where do you draw the line? Uh, there are some families during my research who were reluctant to talk because they could remember that their great-grandfathers, great-grandmothers had brought slaves from Salaga Market made them part of the household. And therefore, if we are going to now try, start tracing genealogies, who comes from where, who comes from there, it starts creating problems. So some of them don't want to talk about it. Is there a, um, a memory of, of a loss of lost people, people who, um, who have disappeared, who are part of families? And um, is there a clear uh, sense of where those people might be? A few of them, uh, but it wasn't very. Uh, a few of the people I talked to in the course of my research could remember that there was a loss of people, loss of population. Those in the northern part of Ghana, for example, uh, claim that there are still parts in Ghana right now which are desolated because of enslavement. And they could recall raids and wars, you know, kidnapping and so on. And um, a friend was telling me that in a certain part of the northern country, a place called Sandema, every year when they have a festival, um, they bring out certain artifacts connected with enslavement. And they've uh, ritualized it to the extent that nobody will tell you about it until the festival is on. And then you find them bringing chains and bangles and so on, and virtually worshiping them in memory of what they went through during enslavement. And that was an area where there was a lot of slave raiding going on, slave kidnapping during the period of enslavement. And then on the coastal parts of the country, there were a few cases of depopulation. And there was one uh, case in which an ethnic song in Ghana. Okay, Professor Kirby, talk to me about, um, and back, in, looking back in time, um, how did trade uh, operate? How were people captured and what happened to them once they were captured? The picture of the past enslavement in Ghana or Africa um, is one in which you find different means of acquiring uh, slaves. I can identify about five major means of acquisition. The first was through warfare, and that was really a major means of acquisition. Now. I don't think we want to enter into that debate whether the wars were fought because of enslavement or the enslavement was incidental to the wars, because there's still a disagreement. But what I have found in my own research as I talk to um, chiefs, elders, and so on, is that 
enslavement was incidental to the wars which were fought in Ghana. In other words, the wars were not expressly fought because they wanted to catch slaves. But there were several reasons for warfare, expansion, conquest, retaliation, aggression, and so on. And if you look through the history of the world from ancient times, you find that it was a practice that whenever you engage in a war and you became victorious, you take away prisoners of war. And in inevitably, these prisoners of war became enslaved as a result. So it became an ancient practice which was carried on through the modern period. And so if you look at Ghana history and Africa history, from about the 15th century to the 19th, early 19th century, you find warfare as one major means of enslavement. And it's very striking, especially when we come to Atlantic enslavement, um, because although warfare was a source of enslavement for both internal and external, you find that the external demand was so high that warfare played a very major role in it. And if you read some of the travelers' accounts and traders' memoirs, you find them mentioning sometimes that in the early 1700s, for example, there was a gentleman called Barbot, a French trader, and he said he had combed the whole of the coastline in Ghana and found only eight slaves from east to west. But two, three weeks earlier, because there was warfare, somebody had gotten about 200 to 300 slaves. And you find them expressing these things in their memoirs as you read. And they seem to be sad that there is no war. You know. So it created a very major means of uh, providing slaves. So the first was warfare. The second major means was what I'll call direct purchase. Um, there were several markets scattered throughout the continent and different parts of the country where people could go to and buy slaves. Now, I've realized, as I've researched about the slave markets, that people did not go, the markets were not solely for slaves, but there were other items also being traded in. But as you enter the market, you find places for foodstuffs, places for household wear, etc., and then you find perhaps a section of the market also devoted for a trade in human beings. And I've been amazed in the course of my research to find that I've discovered at least about 35 of such slave markets in Ghana alone. And every region in Ghana had at least two or three slave markets. And what is significant about this is that with respect to the indigenous enslavement, uh, the ordinary person could go to any of the markets and buy a slave or two for personal use. And so the markets were the commonest source of acquiring slaves, so far as the indigenous system was concerned. It also helped the external system, but warfare was the major source for the external system. And the markets were the commonest source for the ordinary person who would go to the market, depending on your demand and your personal requirement, to buy one or two or whatever number of slaves you wanted to buy. So that was the market source. And then the third source was through what I'll call raids and kidnapping. Uh, we find that different states in Ghana, uh, the kings and chiefs would go to their neighbors and raid or kidnap people and enslave them. There was one particular state in Ghana called Akwemu, uh, which was noted for this. In the 18th century, two of their chiefs organized bands just to raid and kidnap for the Atlantic enslavement. And there were reports that different parts of the coast in Ghana were also involved in raiding and kidnapping. And then the northern part of Ghana was also noted for a lot of slave raiding and kidnapping during the period of enslavement. So that was a third source. The fourth is what I'll call tribute. Tribute was when a state defeated another state and asked the defeated state to pay tribute. And in the past, Normally, you would look at what the state produced. For example, if it was a gold-producing area, you would ask the state to provide maybe so many ounces of gold a year as tribute. Or if they produced yams or any kind of foodstuffs, you would tell them to produce a certain quantity a year. And during the period of enslavement, especially when the Atlantic enslavement was introduced, the picture you get is that instead of asking only for foodstuffs, some of the kings and chiefs would also ask for human beings as part of their tribute. And especially Asante was noted for this. And Asante, for example, would ask Salaga for about a 1,000 slaves every year, would ask some people from the coastal parts, Fante, Ga, to provide maybe another 500 or 300 slaves every year. So tribute was another means of enslavement. And the last means, I talked about five means, 
The last is what I'll call minor sources of enslavement. For example, if somebody owed a debt, he couldn't pay, he could be enslaved. Or somebody was convicted of a crime, he could be enslaved. Or sometimes through deception, people could be enslaved through deception. But these were very, very small instances of enslavement. Describe for me, give me a portrait of the kinds of people who were uh, either captured or paid and sent in tribute uh, or, um, or um, even found themselves victims of raids, who found themselves enslaved and were then um, a part of the, the, the mass of people who, who traveled across the ocean to the Americas. Yes. The kind of people who were enslaved was a broad spectrum because normally if it was war or raids or kidnapping, they would move into a town or a village and conquer and take all the people. And when you read the documents, you find statements like they've dragged all the men, women, boys and girls away. Um, sometimes you find that they've left the older men and the older women, but they've taken the young boys, the girls away. So you find that it's the people in the prime of their youth who are usually taken. And it, sometimes it goes through a series of processes. First of all, you raid a group or you engage in warfare, you bring en masse to your home, that is your capital, thousands of prisoners of warfare. And then sometimes they go through sorting, um, looking at what the indigenous requirement is. So you look at what you have, the men, the women, the boys, the girls, what your internal needs would be like. And then you decide that, well, for example, if you've got about 100 slaves and you have about 50 men, 50 women, or 25 men, 25 boys, 50, 25 girls, 25, you'll decide that maybe I'll leave 20, 24 in the state and send the rest away. Inevitably, what happened was that a lot of the younger people who were strong and who could work were those who were really demanded uh, during the period of enslavement because of the kind of work people wanted them to do. So your needs determined the kind of people you would take. So you find a broad spectrum of people, young boys, girls, women, and men. And it is generally believed that Africans wanted more of the women than the men during the period of enslavement. So we have more women used internally and more men sent away on enslavement. It, but it also included women. Were the demands or the interests of the Europeans and their own needs for a workforce part of whether um, men or women were the, the dominant group sent overseas? Yes, it was the external demand which created the kind of um, people they wanted. Um, they wanted both men and women, but their preference was for men because the, most people wanted them to work in the mines, uh, to work in the fields, and to do what people call the hard back-breaking work. And normally they felt that it was the men who were stronger to do these things. So it was more of an asset to have men than women. And interestingly, as I go through this research, I found that for the Atlantic enslavement, the prices of men were usually higher than women. And for the internal enslavement, the prices of women were higher than men. So if you went to the slave markets, for example, you find that if there are men and women, the prices of women were always higher than the men because of the internal demand. And when the slaves moved to the coast to be shipped across the Atlantic, the men would put a higher price, um, the European and American merchants would put a higher price on the men than the women. And so that was the nature of the work uh, determined uh, the men and women you wanted, or the boys and girls you wanted. Was there a, a, a great difference between what you call the external slave uh, enslavement and internal enslavement? And, and if there is, talk to me about the differences. Oh, there was a big difference. Um, uh, let me say that there were some similarities and differences between the two systems. Similarities in terms of acquisition, um, how uh, slaves were acquired um, were the same for both internal and external enslavement. And I've mentioned five major sources, warfare, market, race and kidnapping, tribute, and minor sources. So this is where the similarity is. But the difference is I found in treatment of slaves internally. Every ethnic group had rules about how slaves should be treated internally. And I've gone through oral history, um, sometimes proverbs, drum language, songs, trying to filter these things out. And I've come across about eight or nine 
rules about how slaves should be treated. Okay, we'll stop right there and pick up. 75, take one. Okay, thank you. Um, we we're talking about the, um, uh, you're giving profile to people who were, who were um, enslaved and coming over. Um, talk to me about some of the skills that they, the, the, the kinds of skills, the, the skills, religion, things like that that gives me an idea of what they were, what kinds of things they brought with them, those who, who, were, who went on the external trade, or part of the external trade. Well, because um, enslavement covered a whole spectrum of people, um, there were some who were farmers uh, who knew how to till the land. There were some who were artisans, craftsmen, iron workers, uh, goldsmiths would work in gold. Um, there were some who could weave baskets. Uh, there were some who could make pots. And um, there were some too who were fishermen who were on the coast fishing. There were some who were hunters who could hunt, and um, there were some who were traders who knew how to trade. So you had this broad spectrum of people uh, being sent away on the Atlantic enslavement. And right now, people are still lamenting about the fact that Africa's development has lagged behind, partly because those who were biologically strong and economically productive were those who were sent on enslavement. So industry, trade, agriculture dwindled or came to a standstill in Ghana and Africa while these skills were being transferred outside to help those outside. Okay. Okay. 75, take two. Professor Furby, um, we were talking before, you talked about how the um, the trade, especially the external trade we were uh, getting to a little bit in the last answer, affected the economic and social development of Africa. But you, you also talked about how it had very very specific ways that it affected uh, things like families and relationships, and, um, um, and it created a whole era of fear and suspicion around the Atlantic trade. Talk about that and what the impact of the trade on, on Africa, especially this part of Africa. Yeah. Yes. Um there were several effects of the Atlantic enslavement on Africa, and especially in Ghana. One of the glaring effects was that of depopulation in several parts of the country. Because there was increased warfare, increased raiding, increased kidnapping, we have different parts of the country being depopulated and desolated because of this. And then because of the increase raids and kidnapping. There was also a lot of insecurity and fear during the period of Atlantic enslavement because you wouldn't know what would happen when you go to bed in the night or what would happen if you are going on your way to trade because there were people who were kidnapping both during the day and in the night. Some would lay ambush just because of the Atlantic demand. And the Atlantic enslavement also affected family ties and social relationships because uh, people could be enslaved through deception, and that was not a pleasant ad idea at all. I read in the Danish records of a case in which a man from Akwemu went to the Danish fort at Osu and wanted to buy some goods. And after it, looking at all the goods in the warehouse, he indicated that the Danish people had so many beautiful goods, but he did not have money to pay for these goods. And then he decided somehow that he was going to exchange his wife in return for these goods. So he made an arrangement with the servants in the castle and told them that he was going to do this. About an hour or two later, he came with the wife and they went through the warehouse selecting the goods. And you know how women are so excited about buying things. She bought all kinds of things, not knowing that she was going to be exchanged for the goods. So when they, they finished taking the goods, there was a scuffle between the Akwamu man and the servants. It was an arranged scuffle. And then they chained this woman and took her away. And there were several cases of this kind of deception. So if, if my husband could do that to me, then I couldn't even trust my husband because I wouldn't know what would happen next. And there were cases where, during court cases, um, where previously in the indigenous enslavement, somebody would be asked to pay a fine 
for an offense committed because of Atlantic demand. Instead of a fine, the person will be sold into slavery. So it affected justice, even the administration of justice. And there were some cases where kings and chiefs could even enslave their brothers uh, because instead of asking the person to pay a fine, he would send him to enslavement. There was this case in Commenda where the king enslaved both the brother, the wife, and the children because the brother had committed an offense. And previously, he would have been asked to pay a fine, but he enslaved him through the Atlantic means because of this. So there was a lot of suspicion, a lot of insecurity, and a lot of fear during the period of enslavement because you wouldn't know what would happen next. So it wasn't a pleasant uh, time at all. Um, it also affected industry, agriculture, um, because most of the people who would be stronger to work were taken out to go and work for other people in other lands. So we find that agriculture declines, and then it also affects industry, because the gold mining industry is affected, salt making is affected, um, iron working, a lot of industry grinds to a halt because of Atlantic enslavement. And this was not a pleasant experience at all for Africa. Seventy-five, take three. Tell me the story again uh, about the, um, the man who goes with his wife to, uh, uh, to buy goods. There was this story which happened around the 17th, early 18th century in Accra, where there was a man from Akwemu who went to the castle at Osu, the Danish castle, and wanted to buy some goods. And he looked through the warehouse and told the Danish governor, oh, you have so many beautiful goods but I don't have money to pay for them. And then something went through his mind. He decided that he would exchange his wife for the goods. So he agreed with the castle servants that he would bring his wife and exchange the wife for the goods. So in about an hour or two, he came back, went around with the wife, picking all the goods in the warehouse. And you know how women are so excited about shopping and buying. This woman picked all kinds of goods. Then as soon as they finished, there was a pre-arranged scuffle between the Akwamu man and the servants. And the woman was chained and exchanged for the goods. So this kind of deception, if a man could do that to his wife, then it meant that during the period of Atlantic enslavement, you could not trust anybody. You could not trust your husband because you didn't know what would happen. You know? So this was the, a period of real mistrust, suspicion, and fear. Mm -hmm. um. Seventy-five, take four. Um, talk to me about uh, about guns and gunpowder, and how um, that became a major element within the trade, and how it began to transform the nature of the trade on the, in this part, and also the landscape and, and, and power relationships in, in this area as well. Guns and gunpowder um, played a very important role in Atlantic enslavement especially from 1650 onwards. And this is where you find the impact, because if you look at what was happening during the Atlantic trade, 15th, 16th century, um, you wouldn't find so many people being enslaved. The numbers were few, and the warfare was not so rampant or insistent. Then in 1650, guns and gunpowder are introduced into Africa and Ghana, and you find suddenly increased warfare state expansion, strengthening, retaliation. And definitely the more power you had, the stronger you had, you were, you were able to prey on the weaker people. So we find that some states, the states which were able to buy more guns and gunpowder expanded, were stronger, preyed on the weaker ones. And the states which were not so wealthy to buy the guns, guns and gunpowder became the victims. So we have states, for example, like Asante, Akwemu, Dahomey, growing stronger and stronger during the period of Atlantic enslavement. And then we have some states in the northern part of Ghana, um, especially the states which were regarded as what the sociologists called as syphilis, who didn't have centralized states, the Dagati, the Gushis, the Lobis, Kusasis, being preyed upon because they didn't have the weapons. So guns and gunpowder was a very important phenomenon during the period of Atlantic enslavement. The more guns and gunpowder you had, the stronger your base, and you could launch any attack because you were more powerful. Mm 
Because at that point, those in the, some states in the northern part of Ghana were using bows and arrows. So if I had a gun, it would, be, it would work faster and do, achieve much more than the person who had bows and arrows. So the people in the north were real victims during this period of Atlantic enslavement. There, we, have very, we have a few testimonies of, 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 um, of actual capture and, uh, uh, in, in Africa. And one of them is Equiano's story. Mm. He tells the story of kidnap. Mm. How would that, a kidnapping like that work? Um, in, in, I know he, he gives us an example, um, but how is it similar to what you found in terms of, of, of that, that type of, of um, capture? Kidnapping could have been of various forms. Um, it could be during the day, it could be in the night. And sometimes you'd be going out to trade, for example, and there will be people who had laid ambush solely to kidnap. So you could be caught while you are on your way to trade. Or you are on your way to the farm, and you find that somebody has laid ambush, he catches you and runs away with you. In the night, it was even worse. So um, you find some of the records indicating that people would want to stay in the house in the night, were afraid to go out because if they could do that during the day, it was even worse in the night time. So it okay, talk to me about the impact of kidnapping, how it began to change people's lifestyles. Mm -hmm. Because of the Atlantic demand for slaves, there was a lot of kidnapping also going on in Africa, especially in Ghana. And kidnapping could be any time of the day. It could be daytime, it could be in the night. You could be on your way to trade or to farm and you could be kidnapped because some people would lay ambush to kidnap. And because of that, there were times when many people were afraid to go out in the night because it was worse during the night. You wouldn't know who was laying ambush uh, to kidnap you. So as you, as you read some of these documents, you find a lot of fear expressed in people's lives during the period of Atlantic enslavement. And you find comments like, nobody dares go out during the night in this part of the coast because of fear that they may be kidnapped into slavery. And kidnapping went on in almost every part of Ghana, especially in the coast and in the northern part. Three years ago, uh, during my research, I was talking to somebody in one of the archives um, in Bronga Hafu called Sunyane. And I was talking about, to him about my research and what I was doing. And then I mentioned kidnapping and so on. And then he said, my grandmother was kidnapped into enslavement. And I was surprised, and I said, tell me more. And he said, my grandmother said he remembers very well, she remembers very well that they were in a rice field in the northern part of the country, and they were working on the rice farms when Samori's men came and kidnapped them. Now, Samori Turi was one of these um, people who tried to build a large African state in the northern part of Ghana and part of what is today Burkina Faso. And by doing that, he also got involved in a lot of slave raiding and slave kidnapping. And he said he remembers, she remembers very well, some of his men kept kidnapping a number of them when they were busy on the farm and bringing them to Ghana. And it happened that somebody um, took their grandmother into the household, married her, and so these people are now part of a family in the Bronga Hafu region. So it happened both internally and externally, you know, but it increased because of the external demand and you find that effect as you go through the documents. And if you look at from the 16th to the 19th century, especially 17th, 18th, when the trade is at its peak, you find a lot of kidnapping going on because of the Atlantic demand. Um, I mean, following up on that, uh, you, you talk at uh, times about songs and drum language and things like this that are associated with the trade. Do you, have, you ever reco have you recovered songs or uh, or things that are laments to these people who have disappeared, because probably every village, every family might have a story of someone who might have disappeared in the past. Right? Yes, um, you have songs, uh, drum language, both from the state and from families. Uh, some families remember uh, loved ones they've lost. Uh, some of the states also recount, especially when it becomes a state affair, maybe warfare or kidnapping or raiding and you find a whole host of people being taken away, you find that some of the states record these in their songs. There's one song among the Ga in Accra where they mention uh, that in the 17th century, they've lost everybody. And it's a long song. And then they mention 
the different families. And then they mention the family and say, where are your boys and girls, men and women? They've snatched them all away. They mention another family and they say, where are all your men and women? They've snatched them all away. So those songs are also there. Then you find some of the drum languages uh, mentioning this. Um, in fact, some of them not only mention the loss of people, but they also show where they come from. For example, in Asante, there's one drum language which says, Oto misrim, nanansu to misrim empensa, which says that he bought me from the north. Nana, or the chief, bought me from the north for 3,000 kola nuts. So it also talks about how they were acquired and sometimes how they were treated. And then we have a lot of proverbs and sayings about how slaves were treated internally. And you get this from proverbs, you get this from songs, you get this from drum language and so on about the treatment of slaves in the internal system. So we're uh, 76, take three. Let's pick up with the difference between the internal and external trade. Give me uh, examples of similarities as well as the differences. Um, the main similarity between the internal and external enslavement was in terms of how slaves were acquired. Um, the acquisition was the same, warfare, market, race, kidnapping, uh, and so on. But in terms of treatment, this is where the difference lies. But in terms of treatment, there's a big difference between the internal and external enslavement. In the internal enslavement, there were rules, traditional rules about how slaves should be treated. And every ethnic group had the rules. And I've tried to sort out a few of these, and I can mention a few of these things to you. The first traditional rule was that any slave that entered into a household had to be made part of the family. And so the slave was made part of the family in the African traditional sense of the word. Now, it could be done in several ways, either through adoption of the slave or through marriage of the slave. If the slave was a female, it would be through marriage. If it was a male, it would be through adoption. And there were some people who, um, especially women who could not have children, who would go to some of these slave markets to buy children and adopt and make them part of the family. So that was one, making the slave part of the family. And then the second was that every slave was entitled to food, clothing, and shelter. So you had to treat your slave as you would your child or you would your brother or sister who was staying with you. The third rule was that every person who had a slave, their owner had to be approachable or accessible. And there were proverbs connected with this. And then sometimes they would say that you should also be able to train and discipline your slave as you would your own child. And there were sayings about this. One of this, which I like so much, was that if you fear to reprimand your female slave, you eat dirty food. So in as much as you want to make the slave part of your household, provide all the necessities, you also have to train and discipline the slave when necessary. And tradition also talks about punishing your slave if the slave did wrong. But an important point to note about punishment was that in Africa, and especially in Ghana, no slave owner had the power of life and death over the slave. It was only the king or chief who had power of life and death, not only over the slave, but over every citizen in the state. So when it came to issues like human sacrifice, for example, it was only the kings and chiefs who performed sacrifices. It wasn't any ordinary person who did it, because they had the power of life and death. And as I go through these research materials, I found that any person who maltreated his slave to the point of death faced the traditional courts and was punished as a result of that because the rules did not allow power of life and death over the slave. And then a slave could marry. He could marry his owner or could marry the owner's relations. And there were rules about how the ceremony should be performed, how it was recognized legally, and so on. And then um, a slave could also acquire, inherit, and own property. And then a slave could also be a king or chief when the suitable is uh, were not ripe to inherit us too. So these were some of the things which made internal enslavement very different from external enslavement. And there's still a debate going on among historians and anthropologists who study African uh, indigenous system of slavery as to whether the word slave is even suitable for the African system. 
And you find people are suggesting now that if you are studying a particular African area, look at the word which is used, the indigenous word for slave, because it will bring up all the idea of treatment, um, how you want the slave to live with you, how you regard the slave, more better than talking about an English word which says slaves, which brings all kinds of ideas and connotations. So for the, for the, for the African who was captured and enslaved and then sold um, at the castles to, for a journey across sea, what are their expectations that they will have, what they will exist in a world that they know, an enslavement they know? And Yes, I think um, those slaves who were sent to the castles to be shipped across the Atlantic would have a faint idea of what will be happening across the sea. From what we know in our internal system, they'll think that they're going to be treated the same way. Uh, they're going to be made part of the family. They could inherit and acquire property. They could marry and so on. And I'm sure many of them got a shock when they went out. And the journey began... If you look at what happened in the castles, which was purely an European administration, you find that that is where perhaps some of the slaves will get their first cultural shock. Because they realize that right in the castle is a different administration from what happens outside the castle in the African internal state system. And I've realized also that if many of those who went out, that is across the Atlantic, were able to come back to tell their story, perhaps the reaction of the chiefs and people to enslavement would have been different because hardly anybody came back to tell the story. Some who came back came during the period of abolition when there was a lot of hue and cry already about stopping the slave trade. So those who came back to tell the story came at a time when a lot of harm had already been done. But when the harm was being done, if the kings and chiefs knew that the treatment was different, perhaps the attitude would have also been very different. I read a portion, uh, an interview between one of the Asante chiefs and somebody who went to Asante in 1817. And the Asante chief was called Osei Bunsu. And he was asking why the Atlantic enslavement had been abolished. It had been abolished by Britain in 1807. And this was 1817. And he was beginning to feel the impact because Asante was still engaged in a lot of warfare. So the problem was, what do I do? Okay, I want to pick that up. 77, take one. Pick up with we were talking about people not coming back to tell, and you were about to tell me a story about a Shanti story. Yes. Um, okay. In 1817, um, there was this British traveler to Asante, and he spoke to the Asante Hine at that time called Osei Bunsu. And Osei Bunsu was asking why the British had abolished the Atlantic enslavement. Uh, Britain had passed a law in 1807, and this was 1817, and Asante was beginning to feel the effects of the Atlantic enslavement abolition. Because Asante was still engaged in a lot of warfare, so there were still a lot of prisoners of war. And this is where you see the relationship and the effect of Atlantic enslavement, because it would have been an easy access. You know, there would be access on the coast for all these slaves to be shipped. Now Asante was torn with what to do with all these prisoners of war. And then this envoy tried to explain to the Asante Hine that we stopped because he looked at the humanitarian reasons. It was bad, it caused warfare, it did this, it did that. And the Asante chief was very surprised. He said, oh, did you know this all along when we were involved in this trade all these years? But we didn't think it was bad. And then he brings out what our internal system and understanding is about enslavement. So it meant that when the two people were involved in the trade, both of them had a different idea of what was happening. So for the African, he knew the internal indigenous system, and he thought it was the same system which was being followed elsewhere. So that was the first time in 1817, when the trade had been abolished 10 years ago, that the Asante Hinimbi was even made aware of the differences between the two systems. You said to, you were saying just earlier that um, probably at the fort, it's the first time the African began to realize this mm -hmm. was something different. Mm -hmm. um, Try to give me some specifics in terms of the kinds of things that would kind of stand out. Suppose a whole family's been captured, kidnapped, brought down from the north, you know, traveled all the way together down to the castle. What would they encounter in the castle that would suddenly let them know that this is not going to be the same situation? They're not going to be inherited into it, taken into a family and become a part of any clan. But things would be severely different. Well, if whole families are taken, for example, from the north to the coast, one of the things which will strike them is that they'll be separated. 
and the separation would at once tell them that something is happening. Because most people who would have families would want to keep them. Because in the African sense, the more families you had, the larger the family, the better. And in terms of labor, in terms of wealth, in terms of prestige. So you wouldn't separate families, you would keep them because they were an important asset. Now you get to the fort and castle, and the first thing which is done is separation. You are not regarded as one family anymore. Uh, you are separated. Father, mother, children are all separated. And that will be the first thing. The second thing perhaps which will surprise some of them would be maybe the way they are treated in terms of harshness or in terms of even food that they are given. Um, Seventy-seven, take two. Talk to me about the family coming down from the north. What would they encounter at the castle? Why would they know once they arrived at the castle things were going to be different? If a family is brought down from the north, for example, to the coast during the Atlantic enslavement, one of the first cultural shocks they would have will be separation. In the internal system, the more people you had, the better it was. So you wouldn't separate families who have been enslaved because you needed them you needed them for social reasons, for prestige, and so on. Now, if a family gets to the castle, and one of the first shocks is that they're going to be separated. They're not going to be recognized as one family. They're going to be recognized as any other individual human being. And perhaps another second shock any family which gets to the courts and castles will experience will be in terms of how they are treated. Because in the internal system, we've mentioned how uh, slaves were supposed to be treated in terms of food, clothing, shelter, uh, caring for them, making them as part of your children. And they'll realize at once that there's an impersonal aspect to their treatment. Perhaps even the food they are given may not be enough. Perhaps they will not be properly clothed. Maybe the same clothes they wore on their way will be what they'll be wearing. And so they'll find that they are in a different world altogether, in terms of treatment, how they are cared for, uh, what the concern of the new owners are. And I'm sure that would have given them a sign that they are in for something very, very different. And of course, if they are shipped across the sea, we know the story already. The experience in the ship, the long journey, and what happens outside, it's another further cultural shock. And what um, saddens me about this whole thing is the fact that people cannot come back to tell the story. They come back when it's very late, when abolition is in the way, to tell the story that this is very, very different from what we knew. Um, I have had some kind of cultural shock myself, personally, in 1993-94, I was in the University of Texas in Austin, U.S. for one year, doing some research from the American sources, because I had done a lot on the Ghanaian sources. I had been to London to look at British sources. And I was looking at the American sources. And from my experience in the indigenous system, I had an idea of how indigenous enslavement was like. And as I read through these American sources, sometimes I felt like closing the books, because I couldn't take it any longer. And I couldn't reconcile. And sometimes I had to go back a few days and strengthen myself emotionally and come back and say, now you're a historian. Look at the facts as they stand, you know, and then go through this. And I found some of the students who come from the U.S. Every summer we have some summer schools and programs for them. And I find that when I tell them about the indigenous system, they also get confused because they are used to a certain kind of system outside. And I have a lot of questions trying to understand the internal system. So they too were really different. And I think it's important to recognize this as we talk about slavery in Africa. Thank you. Uh, this